So welcome to Jean Marie River. Um, it's a small community along uh, the Mackenzie uh, River, but it's a very active community. They have a lot of uh, traditional activities on their lands. Uh, they hunt, they trap, they fish, uh, they um, gather fruits and, uh, and plants. And as they are uh, walking their lands, they start to see that some uh, landscape change uh, was, were occurring on their land. And they start to be concerned as how this change was, uh, will affect their traditional activities and especially their uh, uh, country food supply activities. So I guess uh, you know that we all blame permafrost. So that's what we did. And we wanted to, uh, we wanted to, uh, to map permafrost hazard in uh, the traditional, land, traditional lands of the community and um, uh, to be able to have a sustainable development of uh, the community. So to be sure that infrastructures and housing were safe or to know if there was some upcoming problem with them. And also to uh, deal with this problem of country food supply as the community really rely on, uh, on hunt and, uh, and trap to uh, have cheap, affordable food for the community. And also we wanted to start to think about uh, adaptation strategy. So the first things we did was to uh, map the landscape change uh, observed by the community. And we made this map. The, um, um, the, black, the black area, the black buffer area, is our uh, study area. And well, they, not, they noticed that there was a lot of collapsing mounds and uh, resulting in the formation of wetlands or of ponds. And there was also a lot of uh, trees collapsing around. And these trees were a problem because they were uh, um, blocking trails and the tribe lines. And there was uh, also erosion along the banks of the, the Jean Marie uh, River creeks, causing also landslide. So that was the main uh, change that they were observing. Then we, we went on field and we did a lot of uh, probing, digging. Uh, we cored some permafrost cores when we found permafrost. Excavation, uh, very hazardous one. Um, and also we were looking at the vegetation because sometimes vegetation helps us to map permafrost. So in Jean Marie uh, area, you have two kinds of permafrost. One is uh, consists in uh, palsas that are frost eaves, uh, frost eaves mounds occurring in peatland with moss. And most of the time, permafrost consists of organic soil, frozen organic soil. And it is not very deep. It's uh, between three and maybe four meters. And the other type of obvious permafrost was uh, more east, uh, west to the village. And it was more also frost mounds, but it was, um, it was little size because in this case, permafrost is mostly mineral soil. Frozen min mineral soil, and as you can see in the picture at the bottom, it's a very ice switch permafrost. And in this area, permafrost is uh, ongoing uh, heavy degradation. You can see all these lakes are, perm uh, are thermocast lakes, and permafrost is occurring in this area as well in, in, in the shape of, uh, of frosty mounds, but also in the woods. And you see that degradation also occurs in the woods. Um, this permafrost is also thicker, but as I said, he has heavy sign of degradation. And it is re really, really warm permafrost. We put some uh, thermistor wires this summer, and these are the temperatures that we got for three of our sites. Um, it's close to zero degrees Celsius, and the minimum temperature that we had was minus 0.2 degrees Celsius. So uh, we can say that it's permafrost uh, on, uh, on the brink of, of disappearance. 
So now about the mapping, well, yes, we start with uh, superficial geology, that's a classic now, and uh, using uh, superficial geology maps, uh, we characterize uh, terrains that was m the most susceptible to have permafrost. We, mash, we, we mashed these maps with our observation on field. And we get a first map of permafrost, potential permafrost distribution, depending on the superficial geology. You see a different kind of level, the red being like the area where we are pretty sure that we have permafrost. Um, and the two areas where the probability are less important. Then we use the Landsat satellite, satellite imagery to make a vegetation classification and do another map of uh, probability of presence of permafrost in the land using, using this uh, vegetation classification. And we merge the two of them and after that, we came back to the basics, to air photo interpretation, to check our, uh, to check our, uh, our um, hazard map, and uh, correct and, uh, and validate our, our mapping process using uh, the two previous maps. Yeah, so, and we get this kind of, of map. So at the end, we obtained, we obtained this map for uh, hazard permafrost map. And from this map, we know that we didn't have so much problem about permafrost for the community. There was no permafrost in the community. There was only some areas where permafrost was uh, occurring very close uh, to the access road, and a road that is very important for the community. Um, and that's it for this infrastructure and uh, housing aspect. Now, we were also concerned by country food. So what we, are, what we, what we made was to map all the sites that were used to uh, harvest country food, at least in terms of game. So we map the site where, for example, in this map, we map the sites where they were uh, hunting uh, big game, like moose or wood caribou, forest caribou. And on our study area, we saw that some of the, of the site of harvesting was close by or on very sensitive or medium sensitive uh, permafrost area. Uh, we, know, we knew also that some of the big game trail have been obstructed by fallen trees. And I put this picture to show you what looks like permafrost environment also in, uh, in close to Jean Marie. It always associated with uh, lichens. And we know that caribou, for example, feed on lichens. And you find lichens in this area only where there is permafrost. So you can imagine that if permafrost disappears, they can disappear, and for example, the caribou will go elsewhere. We did the same thing with a uh, small game, and we reached the same, uh, the same conclusion that a lot of sites of harvesting uh, small games were located on, uh, on, um, on sensitive permafrost area. Often, they were associated with uh, permafrost mounds that are now disappearing. Many trails and trap lines also pass through this, uh, this area, and uh, they start to be uh, obstructed by trees, but also par, uh, by, uh, by water and pond forming. This car, uh, these maps uh, show you the uh, sites for uh, ar uh, harvesting birds, and you see that, well, technically, new wetlands should be uh, a good thing, for, for example, for waterfall. Um, it provides more habitat for them. Yet, the community members noted that there are far fewer birds along the road and the river than there used to be. And also, um, community members reported that there was uh, less, fewer birds and fewer uh, 
waterfall in the area where the permafrost was degrading. Finally, we had also a map for uh, fish harvesting. And apparently, when you think about that, permafrost degradation should not affect fish because, well, fish lives in water. Yet, uh, the community member pointed out that there was a decline in quality and quantity of fish. And um, we know that many fish harvesting areas are close to, uh, uh, are contiguous to uh, uh, sensitive permafrost and vulnerable areas. Um, we have this specific problem in uh, Ekali Lake, here, where um, they have a problem with uh, mercury contamination in the lake, and uh, the fish uh, is uh, contaminated with mercury, so they cannot uh, eat as much fish as they want per week coming from this lake, and there is no real explanation about the presence of this mercury in the lake because we are in the middle of nowhere, no industry. And uh, one thing that we start to look at is like, is it possible that eventually permafrost degradation are leaching some, uh, some contaminant? Like we know that pits sometimes can, uh, some pits tend to trap mercury, natural mercury occurring uh, in the atmosphere. So it's something we want to study and a Lake is surrounded by uh, permafrost, uh, by sensitive permafrost area. So the next step, well, it is uh, the second year of this study now, and we considerably uh, uh, we increased our study area, and now we are comprising uh, all, most of the traditional land. So, um, sorry, and. Uh, and so we're expanding the, the mapping, and uh, we try to forecast how better how the, uh, the, um, the permafrost degradation will uh, impact uh, the access to country food. And uh, also we want uh, uh, to investigate uh, the permafrost as potentially origin for contamination. And uh, now it's time for Margaret. My part of the presentation is to share with you um, how uh, the climate change uh, projects that we have embarked on were community driven and how we had uh, established uh, a working relationship partnership with scientists, specialists, researchers. Uh, since we are a very small community, uh, we needed to uh, reach out uh, for help. Uh, this is the, uh, the slide on the initial meeting that we had in July. And uh, one, of the, one of my roles is to translate uh, for the elders. We have three present uh, at this meeting and also translate for Fabrice. So sometimes I find it very challenging to um, translate uh, scientific words uh, into the Dene language so that it could be understood. Um, So, um, just prior to this um, um, permafrost, um, two year to permafrost study, uh, we did a, um, a baseline study that, uh, where we've collected all the information from the, from the elders and the harvesters and uh, uh, came up with some recommendations as to where we wanted to go. So uh, we had another meeting where we've talked about uh, um, where we wanted to go. 
and uh, the priority was to um, go and do more a study on permafrost. Um, we needed to know um, um, before we do anything else to know exactly what's underneath our community. So that's where we decided to go. Um, the so we end up doing the um, mapping sessions where we've asked questions as to what are the changes in the landscape and where are they. So um, we have did a kind of an in-depth um, discussion on just exactly where um, these uh, changes are occurring in the, the landscape. Here you see the, the chief and the sub-chief uh, examining the uh, um, core sample of, uh, of ice. Uh, I think when we've, uh, when Fabrice and his group of people showed us this, um, the, these cores, and everybody just got really, really excited in, about uh, what's, what we have found. And um, so after all the, the research and uh, field work and interviews and all these, all the uh, interviews had been translated, transcribed, uh, we, we've put a, um, a draft final um, report together and then we came back and had a meeting with the uh, with the uh, community members uh, to make sure that we have captured everything that uh, needs to be captured. And so here you see that uh, people are examining the the maps, um, reviewing and uh, making comments, final uh, comments. Uh, on the uh, on the project, um, the second year, you know, we were able to do a lot of um, uh, in-depth um, work, and here you see the two elders really examining the map. Uh, um, When we started working on climate change uh, projects, it had been very, very important uh, to the elders that the youth are involved. So we've made sure that uh, we have something. We have um, the, uh, the young people involved. I just like to say uh, at this time that you know uh, uh, I'm the very thankful that uh, we had an opportunity to bring four of our young people. Uh, they were going to school in uh, Fort Simpson. They're all um, uh, in the grade 10 to 12, and so they're going to school in Fort Simpson. So we brought them here with uh, their two supervisors. Not that we expect them to get into trouble. And uh, here uh, they were uh, participating in the training with the, with the drones. Um, and also here, um, uh, they're helping with, we had a field um, trip uh, to locate areas where the perimeter frosts are, and, and then here is uh, Cody helping Fabrice uh, drill uh, while the girls were in the background looking on. Another one about uh, permafrost 
Corey, where uh, Fabrice had uh, brought up this core and was explained to the students, you know, just what's in, in the frozen uh, core. And ground temperature survey, uh, we've, um, this year we put three of, the, of these little gadgets in uh, um, around the community. So this one is on our way uh, into the community on the access road. So we were, um, we've put it in and then uh, we've contacted the school uh, the teacher and uh, and the students. Uh, the students are very young um, now, but they're interested in doing the collecting the data for uh, for the year at least. Um, we also one of the means that we've uh, reached out is through the newspaper digital drum. So. Once in a while, we have um, um, we contact them with our progress on the, the stuff that we do in climate change area. And um, there's a couple of people that are from the community that help out with uh, with the field work, and so. Um, here, I think, is Arnold uh, digging, uh, digging a hole. And also here is Jonas with Fabrice. Uh, this is one of the last of the uh, frost mounts that, uh, that was collapsing. This is the last little bit of it that uh, we uh, were working uh, to see if um, what exactly is happening there. And here is Noel uh, helping Fabrice uh, drilling. And we had to make a field trip uh, to one of the lakes um, uh, so that we could put in one of these uh, temperature gadgets. Uh, so it was a fun day. We were just filled up one boat and went for a trip. And thank you. Are there any questions for either Fabrice or for Margaret?